So our last talk for the morning uh, is from Charles. Uh, Charles is an associate professor and has been a member of uh, our department since 2007. Uh, he obtained his PhD from UC Berkeley, and his research interests are in computer and human vision and in applications to biological image analysis. His research has been recognized by an NSF Korea Award. Uh, he has also received say, the Mar Prize in 2009 and Helmholtz Prize in 2015 for a significant and long-lasting impact in the field of computer vision. So my group here at UC Irvine works on problems in computational vision, uh, how to understand what's going on in images. So we're interested in being able to take as input images and recognize segment tracked objects moving around in images of complex environments, uh, build and maintain models of scenes, and sort of various applications of these and things like biological image analysis or forensic image analysis. So uh, what is this, this image understanding task? We say, okay, when we look at an image, we see lots of useful information that's possibly extractable from uh, this kind of data. So you might ask to find objects in this image. What things do I see? Or uh, draw a box around them, or maybe even more carefully segment out which pixels in the image belong to particular objects and assign them labels or provide more general descriptions of the scene. I want to say, not only do I know what's in this image, but also what's going on. Here's a person riding a horse in some rural outdoor environment. Uh, so uh, you know, one version of this problem that we're interested in is this, this sort of scene segmentation problem. Here's some examples from our group of taking of input images of street scenes and trying to parse out exactly what's going on here, labeling which pixels are the street finding pedestrians walking across uh, in front of the scene, detecting cars, and so on. And uh, of course, this is uh, the kind of thing that would be very interesting if you're, uh, say, building a, a self-driving vehicle. So this is something that you see in the news, and uh, there's lots of excitement about There's uh, even an extreme level of excitement about this to the point that I had some undergraduate students last quarter who decided they wanted to uh, build their own self-driving car and actually put their vehicle uh, to the test. So maybe let me just play a, a second of this uh, video. So these guys, this is you know, not a, a simulation, but uh, very brave to actually wire up your own car with some actuators to control the brakes and a servo motor to control the steering. And uh, here you see uh, Brendan's got his Mustang attached up to a PlayStation controller, so uh, we, uh, we didn't quite do self-driving. I encourage them to focus on self-parking for now, which is uh, what they're, they're working on, but uh, you know, here he is driving around the parking lot at night with uh, the PlayStation controller in charge of his car. So very, uh, you know, lots, of, lots of excitement and uh, interesting problems to solve here, but of course to build a real self-driving car, an autonomous vehicle, you need to be able to understand what's out on the war road in front of you and be able to make sense of that visual data coming in. And we're interested in lots of other applications of, of imaging, so uh, in particular in biological imaging, looking at data coming from microscopy. Here's a, an example of detecting a C. elegans worm crawling around on a petri dish where we want to monitor the, the lifespan of these animals over several weeks and try to understand what are the biological determinants of aging, how long they last or uh, examples in forensic analysis where I'm trying to decide if this sort of shoe print that I see at the crime of a scene matches a particular shoe. And so the, the general kind of tools that we use to build these systems are based around ideas from machine learning. That is, we want to sort of build up a model that captures the variability in appearance of data that we see out there in the world. So for example, I want to learn to detect people in images. I collect examples of images containing people as well as some sort of negative examples of images which are not people and try to train up a model, a classifier that now when given some new test image can make a prediction. So I say, okay, here's a model, here's a new image. Is this a, a pedestrian or is this some object in the background that's not a person? And the, the key problem here is somehow understanding the variability. That is, when I look at different images of people, they're not you know, sort of cookie cutter uniform, but there's lots of variations due to the way the person's pose, what they're wearing, the appearance, and so on. And so we're, we're able to build up fairly good models, though, which are actually quite 
successful in sort of performing detection and segmentation of individual people. So I just want to point out a few difficulties in this task, right? So this kind of machine learning approach, I have to go around and provide supervised examples of things that I want to recognize in images. But in real kind of complex scenes, when I look out in the room here, I don't see just a single sort of object floating in space. I see collections of objects which are overlap spatially. And so you discover that objects occlude each other. And often the scenes you're interested in they, they interact with each other in interesting ways. So if you want to build a, a model for a person, when I look locally at an image, I see not only parts of that person, but parts of other people occluding it. And so I need some way to sort of model that huge space of possible visual appearances. And uh, in the case of people, or say specifically faces, we can think about building sort of hierarchical models that decompose those objects we want to find into smaller parts. So maybe here, I decompose a face into different components, eyes and eyebrows, and each of those components into individual key points. And now, if I think about the model in these terms, then I can reason about cases where some of these parts are missing in the visual data. And this ends up being a very sort of uh, useful thing to try and model real world data where someone's standing with you know, some object in front of their face. So in particular, if you want to actually sort of find the precise locations of key points in someone's face, it's very important if they're wearing sunglasses or they're uh, eating here, as you'll be doing in a couple minutes as soon as I stop talking, then uh, uh, you know, some of those features are different, right? They're not the face we expect. It's the cob of corn. And so if we can reason about the fact that they're missing, that gives us much sort of better models for detecting people. And that's, of course, essential if you want to work in cluttered environments or if you're trying to make very fine distinctions about, say, who is this that I'm looking at? Being able to distinguish which patches of the image are actually corresponding to the face or not are very important. So this is an example of doing facial recognition, where if we sort of ignore the fact that these parts of the image are included, we incorrectly recognize this person as someone else because <coughs> the overall match seems to be better. So this is an example of sort of things in front of the object that you want to find. Uh, but another sort of interesting case is things in the background. And so here is sort of a, a difficulty looking at a scene, again, trying to find people. And uh, in this particular scene, the people I'm interested in are standing down here on the ground. And so here's sort of a zoomed in patch of a person that we've detected. Here's another person, which is you know, a bit harder to detect. And then here's something which looks exactly like a person in many regards, but of course is not. Right? This is one of these statues up on the side of the building. And so, uh, you know, when you look at the scene as a whole, you're able to somehow rule out these statues as possible people, but our, our detector, which is just looking at this local patch of the image, can't effectively do that. That thing on the right looks very much like the outline of a, a person, as the sculptor intended. And so uh, the, the idea that I want to focus on for the rest of the talk is kind of how to incorporate some sort of contextual reasoning into this process. So I don't want to just go around kind of categorizing each pixel or each patch of pixels independently, but I need some kind of way to incorporate context into the way I, I model this world. If I'm walking down the street, I don't generally expect to see people clinging to the side of the building. And I think this is you know, something which is strongly motivated in these kinds of applications, such as self-driving cars or robotics, where you're not just looking at some random image streaming off the internet, but you actually have some context. That, that image is coming from a camera whose location you know something about. You know where it was a minute ago. You have a guess of where it's going to be now. And so this, this kind of contextual reasoning, that, that image came from some place in the world. And, and so of course, you know, contextual reasoning doesn't solve all your problems. So if you're not expecting to look for cars flying through the air, then you can be uh, quite surprised, find sort of uh, unexpected data. But you know, by and large, these are sort of interesting photos for exactly that reason. They violate our, our sense of context. And so you know, what, what does context mean? Well, there's, there's sort of a, a weak kind of context that I tell you, well, this is, you know, this is an outdoor scene. And so you expect to see maybe people in cars and buildings. But you know, you're probably not going to see a dolphin or some other category of object that you might see in a different setting. Um, but I also want to emphasize something that's a, a much kind of stronger context. This, this sort of embodied context, which is, you know, I'm standing here taking this photo. I'm in front of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris during the daytime, holding a camera a couple of feet off the ground. And so suddenly there's a lot more information I might exploit there, right? Like I, I know what the facade of this cathedral looks like. 
And I say, don't let my detector fire on that facade. I know that you know, people should sort of appear down here in the lower half of the image and so on. And so in order to get that strong context, I, I need to sort of incorporate several pieces of information. Where is my camera in the world? And also some kind of model of the world out there in space. And so an area of interest for us is how to kind of build up that strong geometric context, how to localize cameras in the world, and how to make use of that. And there's a few sort of pieces of this puzzle. So one is being able to actually build up 3D models of the world from large collections of photos. And to do that, we have to sort of localize cameras in space and build geometric models of what's going on out in front of those cameras. And we want to do this at scale where we can make use of large quantities of data either gathered systematically or unstructured sort of internet data, say in the case of this cathedral, just a bunch of tourist photos that we've downloaded online. And I think the, the most interesting thing about this is if we can place that data in some sort of geolocalized context, then we can start to integrate other sources of information, maps, and so on. So just to give you a quick sort of picture of how you go about building such models, so imagine I'm walking around with a camera. I want to understand what is the 3D shape of the thing in front of me. This is essentially a, a geometric problem of looking at one image in the next and sort of finding a point that I see in one image and that corresponding point in a second image and now triangulating geometrically, seeing where these rays intersect out in space in front of my camera to place that in a 3D location relative to my camera. And the technologies for doing this have, have been sort of evolving rapidly and really become quite usable over the last few years. So uh, here's a, a version of this we've done here for our local neighborhood around Bren Hall, the engineering quad, if you will. So each of the red dots here represents a, a camera photograph that was taken, and the rest of this cloud of colored points is modeling the, the sort of 3D shape of the buildings around us. So you know, if you need orienting, you're sort of over there at the top of that building. Uh, the, the coffee shop is that sort of round thing out in the middle of the plaza here. So this was a, a, a homebrew effort, of course. You know, Google and any number of other companies are also heavily engaged in this problem of kind of mapping the world in 3D. Uh, our version was to have my graduate student Raul walk around with a, a stick with a couple of cameras on it, so he got a little attention from campus that this was the, the most elaborate selfie stick they'd seen. Mm -hmm. So. So this sort of, you know, by this systematic collection of images, we can build this 3D model, this map of what's going on here. The second piece of this puzzle is now, I take a new image, I need to know where is that image taken? How can I place that in the model? And uh, it ends up, this has some, you know, difficulties to it, but what we really want to do is not just say, okay, I'm, I'm in this city, the GPS data maybe on your cell phone tells you roughly where the camera was taken, photo was taken from, but really, you know, where was the camera in space exactly? And, what direction it was pointed. And so to do this, we again have to do this kind of geometric reasoning of matching features we see in the image, but now we're matching them not between kind of two images in our video, but matching them to a large database of images that we use to build the 3D model. And this becomes a, an interesting kind of problem just because, you know, if you walk around uh, campus here, this uh, sort of brutalist architecture makes use of heavily repeated elements. And so you discover that there's buildings on campus that have essentially the same shaped window uh, repeated many times. And uh, so there's lots of interesting difficulties. You say, well, locally that window, again, looks very much like this window, even though these are two uh, totally different buildings. And so you have to do some additional kind of filtering. So if I look at an image, I find initial matches to my database of, of photos that I've seen before. I get some candidate set of matches, but they're, they're sort of spread out all over the place on campus and we have to do some kind of uh, filtering to say, okay, let's find a subset of those which are consistent with a particular pose of this camera in 3D in order to really localize exactly where this camera was. So up top, you're sort of seeing the, the red circle is our estimate of where this photo was taken and the green X is its sort of precise position. And this works not only for our, our sort of photos of UCI, here's another example which is a, a 3D model of Dubrovnik, this sort of medieval city. Uh, by the sea, and this one built entirely from sort of tourist photos downloaded from Flickr online. So we can build up these large sort of geometric models of locations, and now given a new photo, figure out where that photo was taken. Uh, 
there's you know some other difficulties here. Here's one of them. You go to grab one of the photos in your data set and register it to your model, and you realize there's someone standing uh, in the way, right? And so from the perspective of building the 3D model, this is sort of a problem, right? Because I don't want to match features on this guy to other images in my data set taken days later where he wasn't there. On the other hand, there's something interesting going on here, which is that if I have the model of the scene, then this guy doesn't match that model in some way. And so that tells me something about what I'm looking at. And uh, so depending on how you want to phrase this, you know, sort of one man's trash is another man's treasure, or one model's outlier is another model's signal. So if I built this sort of rigid static background model of the world, then anything that doesn't look like that is now likely to be some interesting sort of dynamic object in a particular photo. And so we can kind of connect up that 3D model to a problem of recognition. And I say, OK, let's take some new image. I could compare it to my scene reconstruction once I've figured out where the camera is placed. And now look at the difference between these two to suggest where in this image a person might be standing. And so this uh, you know, works, particularly for these sort of heavily photographed facades here so that I'm able to eliminate all those sort of statues that were detected up top just because every photo of the front of Notre Dame features those statues and so clearly they're not a person walking around unless it's a very very still person who's been there for <laughs> centuries right so so this uh, idea we, we referred to as sort of multi-view background subtraction I'm kind of building a model of the background and then subtracting it out of my image um, but you know, it doesn't work perfectly, right? So if it rains, the color of the building, you know, it gets damp and changes. And this, this kind of differencing of images is, is fairly sensitive. And so we said, okay, how can we take this further? How can we sort of deal with cases where we have left, less sort of dense visual sampling of the world? And so here's the, the idea we've been pursuing. I say, I've got my large scale 3D reconstruction, but there's other kinds of data out there. So in particular, if I walk over to the building services here on campus, they'll provide me with a digital map of campus, which was built from, say, some satellite data tracing footprints of buildings. Of course, it's, it's only a 2D map, so I have to somehow align it with my data and make it more 3D. But if I have some sort of rough 3D model of campus, now when I take a new photo, I can use not only kind of the raw pixel measurements that I made in other images, but also use data from this 3D map to help me interpret this image. And so. Uh, Here's sort of a, a zoom in version of this particular, say, map again of the, the engineering quad. So we're right here. We say, OK, let's localize our camera with respect to this map. And now we can say, start to try to upgrade this map. So if we've aligned our 3D reconstruction, then we can go in and say, extrude different bits of this scene. So this is an interface designed for sort of stretching the footprint of the building up into a 3D model. And so with relatively little effort, you can kind of take this 2D map and blow it up into a 3D map and now have something which is a, a more kind of comprehensive coverage of the area that we're looking at. So the additional sort of benefit of this is now that when I take one of my photos, if I localize a camera in space, I'm localizing it not just with respect to other photos, but with also with respect to this sort of 3D map in kind of absolute geographic coordinates. And that map I can view from the perspective of this image by simply sort of rendering my 3D model at this particular camera viewpoint. And so here you see kind of an overlay of the two. Here's another example standing out in front of Bryn Hall. So of course the the 3D model is very crude in some ways for us. It doesn't line up exactly with the building. And you could spend a lot of human effort to kind of manually do this, but this is built largely automatically. And you can see immediately it provides lots of useful information. So if I'm looking at this image from scratch, I say, well, this building has been here for 10 years at least now. It's probably still going to be here tomorrow. And so that back projected model says, let's interpret those pixels as building pixels. And furthermore, it's, it's really a geometric model. So here's sort of a fun example of comparing this kind of blind man's prediction of just where is the camera, here is my rough geometric model, versus what happens if I actually you know, sit a laser range scanner at this particular location and uh, acquire a very detailed depth map. So of course, we're missing the trees and some fine details of the structure. But by and large, the sort of shape of the space in front of you is well captured in this case. So 
what do we do with this data? Well, given a new image, I want to make these same kind of semantic predictions, but now I suddenly have a whole bunch of useful side information in the form of this kind of geometric context. I can talk about what are the labels of different things. This is building or sidewalk that are in my map. I can talk about the geometry, the depth, and response from various sorts of object detectors. And so this lets me do kind of a much better job of labeling pixels in these images and understanding what's going on. And again, this kind of example of you know, running my pedestrian detector on the scene, I sort of fire up here in the trees on blobs of texture that somehow look a little bit like a person, but with that geometric context in play, I can suppress many of those false detections and really focus on where the people are. So these are versions of scenes in, in outdoor spaces, but uh, you can also carry this out indoors. So this is a, a version of this collected here on campus, in this case in a, a colleague's lab over in chemistry, where we walk around with a, a depth camera a connect sensor and build up a 3D map of that space. And of course, one thing you notice immediately here is you know, we have lots of more detail in this case than our, our map of campus. But there's another problem, which is if you go back the next week, right, things have moved around. So that stool that you scanned has now moved a few inches here. The trash can's been bumped around. And so here you're seeing kind of overlaid scans from several different time points, you know, stool moving around, trash can, and so on. And so this idea of having sort of a, a fixed 3D model that we're working against makes kind of an artificial distinction between what is dynamic and what is static. That is, sort of things move on different time scales the buildings every 10 or 20 years, the plants change yearly, the chairs in this room maybe daily, and so we need to think about kind of advancing this picture a bit further into something which is really sort of a, not just a 3D map, but really a, a four-dimensional map that tracks how these scenes change over time, and the, the version of this we envision is sort of I walk through this room every couple of days, and I want to maintain this map such that uh, in the future, I can go back and say, ah, oh, the trash can moved, but these other things were static and really know what that correspondence is from one time to the next. So there's uh, lots of interesting challenges here, in particular, basically dealing with sort of the uncertainty. So when we build a given 3D model of a scene, we may not see every part of the room every time we walk through. Some things move, there's errors in the way we build these models, and so distinguishing what are sort of errors in our model building process from genuine changes out there in the world becomes a interesting sort of modeling problem. So this is sort of where we're headed. How can we digest all of this incoming stream of data in order to build a model which is dynamically updated as more data comes in? So that's kind of using mapping to improve recognition and uh, in these kind of terrestrial settings. And so uh, in the last sort of two minutes here, I want to say a little bit about a different mapping problem, which is a biological imaging problem we're involved in, and that is mapping neurons in the brain. So people are interested in this in the sense that the, the structural information, how neurons, which are very long extended cells that fan out in various directions, their, their shape and structure is really essential to their function. That is, large parts of them behave like wires that convey signals in different directions. So if you want to understand the so-called wiring diagram of the brain, a key piece here is really being able to figure out where these neurons are running within your brain and throughout your body. And this is you know, an old picture. So this is uh, a drawing from Cajal in 1900. So you know, he uh, got the Nobel Prize in 1906 for a, a lifetime, which was spent essentially peering through a microscope and drawing very careful pictures of the morphology of, of neurons. And in some sense, this is uh, something that lends itself to the kinds of tasks we're interested in. Can we instead automate that process? So here, uh, I don't know if the lights will go down at all. So here we uh, get a picture of, I don't have control. Ah, OK. Um, so this is a, a picture of neurons in a, a tissue sample, which have been fluorescently labeled to sort of light up the, the bodies of these cells. And then you see these long processes, which are the, the axons, the wires, and so we're interested in being able to take a, an image like this and now automatically trace out where those connections are going between individual cells. And uh, this is kind of a particularly exciting time to be looking at this sort of data because there's really a lot of uh, revolutionary technology in terms of the, the biotechnology that lets you 
sort of label these cells. So this is uh, fluorescently delivered proteins, which are targeted at different cells, uh, different genetic groups of neurons. And in this case, uh, they're sort of labeled in such a way that each one gets a random color. It gets sort of a mix of red, green, and blue, which helps you distinguish where these different cells are in this image. And the other kind of piece of this, which uh, is advancing rapidly, is our, just our ability to image. So we can image through large volumes of tissue at very high data rates, and we do this in kind of full 3D. So we acquire a, a dense kind of 3D model of what is the fluorescence inside a volume of tissue. Uh, and, and these kinds of microscopes produce you know, terabytes of data a day easily, if you like. And so there's a huge need to handle this kind of flood of image data. Um, so of course, if you've been paying attention, this isn't actually a brain. Any guess what this is? Heart. Heart. Yeah. So uh, this is heart of a mouse, as the, the title says. So uh, you know, it ends up neurons are not confined to your brain. They innervate your whole body. And uh, hearts of, of particular interest. So as we know, uh, you know, heart disease affects a large percentage of the population. And those of us that are fortunate to live that long, this is a model of heart attack in a mouse. On the left, you see sort of the healthy mouse. On the right, you see this tissue damage from a, a heart attack. And so an interesting question, these neurons that are innovating the heart that keep the muscles sort of synchronized and beating effectively as a pump. After a heart attack, a very, very common problem is the development of arrhythmias, where that circuitry is no longer functioning. And so we'd really like to understand how does this happen? How do these neurons sort of re innervate the tissue that's been damaged? And how can this uh, dynamical system sort of readapt after the heart attack. So of course, the, the interesting thing here is that unlike the buildings on campus, every heart is different. So when I image in one mouse and the next mouse, I look at the pattern of neurons here. They have lots of similarities. I say, oh, there's sort of you know, four big bundles of nerves going down here and four or five here. But of course, everyone is distinct and the exact locations of those vary from one individual to the next. So we can't really say that there's a single kind of canonical circuit here. Instead, there's variation among individuals, and we want to, to understand that variation. And so in this case, the version of a, a map that we want to construct is to collect these images from multiple individuals before and after this heart attack condition, map out where these neurons innervate the heart, as well as other types of data, what is the orientation of the muscle fibers, functional data collected while the animal was alive about how the heart is beating in order to really sort of collate this data in one place and understand sort of the significance of the, the pattern of innovation here and the, the function of the heart. So another sort of version of this mapping things contextually, but now within biological systems. So I'll stop there and just acknowledge contributions of uh, many current and former students in my lab who produced the results you saw, as well as these collaborators in the biological domain. So thank you. Questions? Yeah, when uh, you were showing this project with an autonomous car, self driven car, as you drive through the parking lot, I guess it was a very static environment because it was nighttime, but let's move a couple hours ahead of that, before that. Mm -hmm. In order to compute, first you gotta take a picture of the environment, then you gotta figure out what is what and then you have to compute the distance and provide the avoidance algorithm for the car to move around. What's your computing time to process so much information and then make the right, and then there are actuators that take mechanical time to move. So what's happening there? Yeah, so, so this is a very you know, time sensitive kind of application. Uh, in the parking lot, you're going quite slow. Even worse is out on a, a street, you know, driving 30, 40 miles an hour. So, you know, when a pedestrian steps off the curb, hundreds of feet in front of you, you know, they're quite small in the image, but you're going to be on top of them very soon. So, uh, you know, lots of very Im important uh, problems there. I should say, in this example, the sort of actuators that these guys are working with are not suited for that kind of real world environment. So this is. Uh, okay, so it was certainly, certainly limited in that regard, but I think in terms of the, the sort of visual processing time, um, you know, most of these algorithms, so algorithms for pedestrian 
detection, some of these labeling algorithms, we can we can get to work at kind of video frame rates right now. Um, so I think you know they're you know given enough sort of GPUs in the trunk of your car, there's no problem in kind of getting that to work uh, in in nearly real time. Uh, knowing exactly what to do with that data, uh, of course, is still a, a challenge in some ways. Yeah. Uh, this might be a little bit out of the scope of your talk, but out of curiosity, do you know what the biological mechanism is that allows like two neighboring neurons to get randomized RGB values? <laughs> sure. So uh, uh, it, it's to me, it's totally science fiction. Uh, you know, not being a, a biologist who's been developing this, but uh, what we're doing is infecting these mice with virus, which you can think of as like a rabies virus or a, a flu virus. Those virus infect these cells. They carry with them a bit of genetic material. Um, in this case, they carry three different genes, one which ex codes for a protein that fluoresces red or green or blue. Um, so we can, we, we basically insert genes for those different proteins in uh, every cell that's being targeted by the virus. Uh, but now there's a, a trick, which is that we insert them in such a way that basically the, they're backwards in the genome. So by default, they don't get turned into protein. Um, and then there's a component which randomly gets flipped. And so, so there's a, a, a random sort of you know, bit of genetic machinery there which reverses some of them, but not all three of them necessarily in every single individual. And so that, that kind of random... Uh, cutting out and flipping of the bit of genetic is the, the place where the stochasticity comes in. And in this case, there's another problem, which is at least in the cortex, the neurons are incredibly dense. And so if you actually labeled all of them, even with these multicolor systems, you still can't hope to trace them. And so in this case, we actually inject two different viruses, one carrying the colors, and then a second one that's sort of the activator, but at a much lower concentration, so that only a subset of the cells that have the colors in them actually take up the activator and get turned on. And so that gives you sort of sparse, multicolor targeted labeling. Uh, 